Uh, so my name is Anand Rangaraj and I'm the uh, site lead for Google Bangalore and I'm uh, very excited to uh, um, be uh, the program manager with Pankaj Gupta for this uh, uh, for this workshop. Um, I just wanted to tell you that you know this is the first time we're doing a big outreach uh, to the uh, both the academic and the industrial communities here um, about the work we have done and the problems with that we are still working on. Um, we are very excited that a diverse set of people from the industry and the academy are here. Uh, they're going to share their work. They're going to share the kind of problems they are working on. Um, so Bangalore, uh, Google Bangalore itself was started in 2004. So it's, uh, it was one of the very early uh, engineering sites for Google outside the uh, US. Um, we've always been fairly small. Uh, and now we are starting to uh, show some significant growth. Um, Yes, there are lots of uh, chairs here. Please do come along. Okay. Um, yeah, through this day, we are going to have uh, several uh, uh, tracks looking at different aspects of uh, ML and AI. Uh, we'll usually have these uh, tracks such that there'll be small 10 minute talks, and then there'll be a final 10 minute Q&A. So if you can collect your thoughts and then ask them at the end, it might be useful. Um, and uh, there is the Wi-Fi information TV. Yeah, I'll just put it up. In okay, uh, for people who want to uh, use the guest Wi-Fi, um, there are restrooms there. Um, please do uh, try and uh, take breaks between talks. Um, and then during the coffee breaks, we will have the uh, PhD students with their posters uh, in the cafe. So if you're curious about the sorts of problems they're working on, you can uh, go there. Um, anything else, Pankaj? Um, yeah, so for any logistics, there's Ashwani there, and where is Divi? Who was right around here. He just stepped out. Um, so that is that is the guest Wi-Fi <coughs> access point name and the password. Um, all right, with that, we will start uh, uh, the keynotes. Uh, so we, have, we are very excited because we have people visiting us from US, and you also have people dialing in. Uh, later in the day, you'll also hear some leads in uh, Google Bangalore uh, speak about their work. So off to Thanks, Anand. Uh, my name is Pankaj Gupta. I'm also an engineering director at Google in Bangalore. I lead the engineering for a um, uh, consumer payments app called Taze. That's part of Google's Next Billion Users initiative. I joined Google about eight months ago. Uh, Google Echo hired my deep learning startup called Hully Labs. And in fact, in one of the sessions, we are going to hear about uh, at least what one part of Hully Labs was doing later on in the day. So OK, over to keynotes. But um, uh, let me introduce you, Jeff. Um, and then we'll play the video. And then we'll let you do the slides. So I'm really, really excited to kick off this workshop with a keynote by none other than Jeff Dean. The title of his talk is Deep Learning to Solve Challenging Problems. Um, Jeff joined Google in 1999 and is currently a Google Senior Fellow in Google's research group, where he co-founded and now leads the Google Brain team, Google's de deep learning and AI research team. He and his collaborators are working on systems for speech recognition, computer vision, language understanding, and various other ML tasks. He has co-designed and implemented many generations of Google's crawling, indexing, and query serving systems, and co-designed, implemented major pieces of Google's initial advertising and AdSense for content systems. He's also a co-designer and co-implementer of Google's distributed computing infrastructure, including MapReduce, Bigtable and Spanner systems, protocol buffers, the open source TensorFlow system for ML, and a variety of internal and external libraries and developer tools. Jeff received a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington in 1996 working with Craig Chambers on whole program optimization techniques for object-oriented languages. He is a fellow of the ACM, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and a winner of the ACM Prize in Computing and the Mark Wieser Award. So please welcome Jeff. <laughs> Let me play a video that's a really fun video about TensorFlow. We wanted to make machine learning an open source project so that everyone outside of Google could use the same system we're using inside Google.
Awesome. We'll just switch over. Cool. Um, all right. Well, uh, so thank you very much for having me. Um, what I thought I would do is just give a talk about sort of some of the work that our group has been doing on machine learning research and um, some of the ways that we think it's going to impact some uh, difficult problems in the world. So with that, I'm going to just switch to sharing slides, and then I will come back in facial form at the end of the talk. So uh, let's see here. Great. There I am. Can you see that? Oops. Sorry. Wrong button. Yes, we can see it. Thanks. Great. OK, so um, one of the first things is that uh, the interest in deep learning has really gone up significantly over the last uh, you know, six or seven years. Um, part of this is because we've created a new term for something that is actually fairly old. So deep learning is sort of a rebranding of uh, the idea of artificial neural networks. Um, but it's a bit more than that, as I'll discuss. Um, so there's tremendous interest in the machine learning field. Uh, there has been for quite a while, but in the last six or seven years, that growth has, has really taken off. Um, this is a graph of the number of machine learning related archive papers that have been published per year on a, uh, a paper preprint hosting service called Archive. And you can see that it's growing at actually faster than uh, the sort of Moore's law exponential growth rate of uh, computational performance that has been with us for for quite a while, although that's now slowed down. But this field is changing extremely rapidly, and I think and many many people are flocking to this field and are wanting to do new research and are doing great new things in this field. And I think this is a really exciting thing. You see lots and lots of young students, lots of uh, people in other disciplines wanting to sort of start doing uh, research in this field. Um, lots of use across industry and organization. That's, that's tremendous. Um, but as I said, deep learning is really just this modern rebranding of many of the ideas in artificial neural networks, which have been around since the 1970s and 80s. Um, I actually did a, a thesis on parallel training of neural networks in 1990 when I graduated from undergraduate. Um, and uh, the idea behind neural networks is actually a, a, a powerful one, which is that you can learn very complicated functions through these layers that learn features and patterns um, at sort of progressively higher and higher levels of abstraction. So at the very early layers of a neural network, the features that are learned are fairly primitive. But as you combine those powerful feature recognitions, uh, uh, pattern recognitions, then you get more and more complex combinations of these things. Um, so many of the ideas are relatively old in neural networks. Uh, there's been a bunch of progress, uh, as you can see by the previous graph of the number of research papers, um, which is also great. Um, but let me just go over some pretty interesting functions. Because when you hear, oh, it can learn functions, you know, sometimes that doesn't quite resonate with people about how powerful these things can be. So one kind of function that a neural net can easily learn is um, given enough training data of pictures and then labels of what kind of object is in that picture, it can learn to take a new picture, the raw pixels of an image, and then learn to predict a categorical label for that from perhaps, you know, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of categories. Um, they've been used to powerful effect in improving speech recognition. So you can actually train a neural network end to end going from raw audio waveform signals to a transcript of exactly what was said in that audio waveform. How cold is it outside? And this is in contrast to how speech recognition systems have been built for many years, which is they have lots of, they previously have had lots of individual components that are other kinds of machine learning systems and, and manual features. Now we can just learn these things end to end with a neural network. These systems can learn to translate given enough training data of the form, you know, sentence in one language, sentence in another. And so you can input a sentence in English, hello, how are you? 
and then have the model trained to produce a translated output. Bonjour, comment allez-vous? Um, perhaps more surprisingly, you can, they can be trained to emit not just a categorical label given an image, but an entire English sentence that describes the image, which actually shows a pretty decent level of understanding of what's going on in these kinds of scenes. So if you give it this image, the output might be a blue and yellow train traveling down the tracks. So why is this all really happening now? As I said, many of the sort of underlying algorithmic ideas are relatively old. And so in the 1980s and 90s, uh, essentially neural networks were showing really interesting results for very toy problems, but they needed a very large amount of computation, much more than we had available at those times. And so they couldn't really be scaled to work on problems that were you know, uh, real and substantial and impactful although they did show really good results on sort of modest size problems. Uh, and so other approaches that were less computationally intensive kind of uh, were the preferred ones in a lot of machine learning tasks uh, through this time, as you as seen by the green line. But thanks to Moore's law, we've actually gotten much more compute. Uh, you know, when I did my undergrad thesis, I was excited about bringing to bear a 64 processor machine on training a neural network instead of one processor so that we could get you know maybe a factor of 50 or 60 speed up it turns out what we actually needed was a factor of a million more computation not 50 but now that we have that neural networks are actually a the best solution for many many problems and that that gap seems to be increasing relative to other approaches uh, as we add more and more compute which i'll talk about towards the end of the talk so just to give you a sense of the improvement over the last few years, uh, in 2011, uh, the winner of the ImageNet challenge, which is a challenge hosted by Stanford University every year, uh, where you're given an image and have to give a label of one of a 1,000 categories, uh, the winner of that did not use a neural network. And the winning uh, error rate, lowest error rate, was 26% error. And we know that humans have about a 5% error rate on this task. Um, it's actually a reasonably difficult task because among those thousand labels are, you know, perhaps 40 different breeds of dogs, and you have to be able to get the correct breed of dog um, by looking at the photograph, which is not something that humans really excel at. But fast forward five years, every every entrant now pretty much uses neural networks, and the best neural networks are down around three percent error. So the winning entry in 2016, three percent error, below human level. Uh, which is pretty significant. So basically, computer vision has gone from not really working that well to working extremely well in five years. And that's pretty transformative. If you think back to the time in you know, uh, biological evolution when animals evolved eyes, we're sort of at that point in computing today where we didn't used to be able to see very clearly. Now we can see very clearly. And that opens up a lot of, a lot of things that we can do that require vision work well. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'd like to structure it a little bit around something that the U.S. National Academy of Engineering uh, put out in 2008, which is a list of grand engineering challenges for the 21st century. And it's a pretty good list. It's sort of things that I think we as a society, if we make progress on these, we will actually you know, improve the world and, and live happier and, and healthier lives. Um, so I've highlighted a few in red that I'm going to talk about, but I actually think machine learning is going to be a significant contributor to making progress in all of these. Um, I just don't have time in the talk to address exactly how, but I will for the red uh, highlighted items. So um, one of them is restore and improve urban infrastructure. Um, I, I've been to Bangalore, and I've seen the, the, the chaotic traffic there. Um, and we have our own traffic problems here in the Bay Area. But one of the things that we're actually quite close to as a society is um, actually having working self-driving cars, uh, completely autonomous cars. And one of the things that's really powering the fact that we're so close to, to launching these commercially is the fact that vision now works. 
right? Going from raw sensor inputs in these cars where you have LiDAR, which is like a laser range finding depth sensing sensor, plus a bunch of cameras, plus radar data, to something that can actually reconstruct what is going on around the vehicle in a way that can, allows it to plan safely uh, what it wants to do to accomplish the goals of getting to its destination and not hitting anything and, and behaving uh, in a way according to the right traffic laws. You know, that requires a pretty high level of understanding, but key to it is that vision now works. And so uh, we've actually just done some trials in Arizona uh, a couple of months ago without any safety drivers in the vehicle. So that's actually, you know, a reasonably good sign that these things are, you know, imminently going to be released in fairly short order across the world, which I think is going to be pretty, pretty different and will dramatically change the urban landscape. You know, we won't need uh, parking areas as much. We can have cars just come pick us up at will when we want. It will be pretty amazing. Um, advanced health informatics. So our group is actually spending a fair amount of time on how can we use machine learning to improve healthcare. Um, and I'll touch on just a couple of different issues here. One is um, we've been doing a lot of work in medical imaging related tasks. And this is a um, task uh, called uh, a, where you're trying to diagnose whether or not a person's uh, retinal scan has uh, signs or symptoms of diabetic retinopathy, which is a degenerative eye disease. Um, there's about 400 million people at risk, many of them actually in India. And um, these are graded one, two, three, four, or five by human ophthalmologists. And one of the big problems is that if you're at risk for this, you should get screened uh, regularly every year, or perhaps even more often. And there just aren't enough ophthalmologists in the world to screen all the people that should be screened. And so uh, we built up a training set of data of this form with human ophthalmologists uh, giving their opinion on uh, the image. And then you can train a computer vision model to assign the grade in an automated way, given the input image, you say one, two, three, four, or five. Um, and we're actually now uh, significantly better than uh, human ophthalmologists. This, this was a paper published at the end of 2016 in JAMA, which is a, one of the top medical journals, showing that we were on par slightly better than uh, the median board certified ophthalmologists in the United States at doing this task. And we've actually improved this algorithm significantly since then. So we're now on par with retinal specialists rather than general ophthalmologists. We've also uh, discovered kind of interesting new findings in the process of doing this, this work. And so uh, we've actually been able to com devise completely new biomarkers from retinal images that, we, that human ophthalmologists uh, didn't even know existed. And so we can actually use these kinds of predictions to assess someone's cardiovascular risk in a way that is roughly as accurate as a more invasive technique where you actually need to draw blood and assess uh, the cardiovascular risk through a series of blood tests. And so this is a sign of something where um, we've actually been able to use machine learning to create new kinds of, of healthcare signals that uh, previously didn't exist because it's looking at very subtle patterns that human ophthalmologists can't really detect in the eyes. Um, we think that's pretty exciting. Um, another kind of um, medical problem that we're focused on is predictive tasks for healthcare. So given a patient's medical record data, can we actually predict the future? And deep learning methods uh, are actually getting very, very good at sequential prediction tasks. So given you know, an English sentence, can I predict the French sentence or given half of a medical record, can I predict what are the other things that are going to happen to a patient? Um, and if we can do that well, we'd be able to answer questions like, you know, will this patient be readmitted to the hospital in the next week? Or, you know, what are the most likely diagnoses for this patient right now? Uh, which tests should I be considering for this patient? Which patients are at highest risk for, say, developing diabetes in the next month? Um, and so, we have a collaboration with several United States uh, organization, U.S. healthcare organizations um, to try to assess this. And we've actually just uh, published a paper on archive um, 
that essentially shows that we can predict all these different kinds of tasks using the same rough underlying model. And in particular, compared to the baselines techniques that are used in clinical practice today, we can actually predict things like mortality rate uh, or risk of mortality uh, roughly 24 hours earlier. So this solid line at the top of the graph is about 24 hours earlier warning of someone's risk of mortality than the traditional uh, dotted line baseline here. And so that allows doctors you know, much more uh, early guidance about which patients are most at risk and they can pay more attention to those patients. So we think this is gonna be pretty significant. Um, another area is actually several of these grand challenges all kind of depend on better understanding of chemical properties of things. Uh, you know, engineering better medicines is all about finding drugs that bind to the right kinds of things. Solar energy is all about developing, you know, more efficient uh, materials for solar panels. And many of the other ones are also related to chemistry. Um, and so we decided to tackle a particular problem in quantum chemistry, which is given some molecular configuration, you want to predict a bunch of things about that molecular configuration, like does this bind with a different protein? Uh, what are its quantum properties? Is it toxic? And the traditional way that you do this is with a traditional high-performance computing-based uh, uh, chemical simulator that uses something called density functional theory and is fairly slow. So if you run it, it takes maybe an hour for a given configuration to give you the right answers or the, the simulated answers. Um, so we, we decided we could actually use this simulator this computationally expensive simulator as a trainer for a neural network. And so we developed a new kind of uh, uh, network neural network architecture that's good at, at uh, dealing with graphs, the kinds of chemical graphs that you see there. And what we found is that the results on using this neural net and then using the neural net to make these predictions are indistinguishable in accuracy from the, the much more computationally expensive simulators. So we have something that's about 300,000 times faster at doing these kinds of computations and is you know, equivalent accuracy. And we think that's pretty transformative. You know, anytime your tools get 300,000 times faster, that just enables you to do very, very different things. Uh, you, know, you could imagine screening 100 million compounds and taking the 10,000 that are most interesting and and doing more investigative studies of them. Um, okay, the last thing I'll talk about is engineering the tools for scientific discovery. And this will be kind of a, a whole collection of improvements to varying kinds of tools. Um, so the first thing is uh, our group has been producing software to help us with our, or, uh, with our own research and with deploying these kinds of machine learning um, systems into Google products. And we've been doing this kind of work for a long time. And TensorFlow is a system that allows us to express machine learning research ideas and get results quickly. Um, and it's actually our second generation system. And when we started working on it, we decided we would open source it uh, so that um, people outside of Google can use the same tools that we use. And we can collaboratively work together to improve those tools. Um, and Therefore, you, people outside have been able to use it for all kinds of interesting things. Like that introductory video had a lot of interesting uses of TensorFlow that we never imagined when we open sourced it. And I think that's one of the beauties of open source software is that people can take it and use it in all kinds of crazy and, and uh, great ways that you never would have. And collectively, society benefits from this. Um, so we wanted to open source this so that it would be a great platform for everyone. Uh, and this is kind of a, a growth chart of interest in TensorFlow measured by GitHub stars, which is sort of a people can express interest in uh, different repositories on GitHub, which is an open source hosting platform. And this shows the TensorFlow uh, star growth uh, stars over time compared to a bunch of other uh, uh, open source machine learning packages also hosted on GitHub. And so you can see people have really taken to TensorFlow and uh, uh, that community is now working actively, collectively to improve the system. Uh, one of the research projects that we're working on in our group is actually attempting to automate 
the machine learning so that you don't need as much uh, human machine learning expert to expertise to solve a new problem. So the current way you usually solve a machine learning problem is you have some data, you have some computational devices, maybe GPU cards or maybe CPUs or uh, other things. And then you kind of have an ML expert, a machine learning expert, uh, take that and stir it all together. And out of that, you hopefully get a solution to your problem. The machine learning expert runs a bunch of experiments, tries different ways of solving the problem. And hopefully, uh, if you have enough data and the ML expert is, is good, you'll get a good solution. Uh, what we're trying to do is see if we can turn this into a automated process where we don't actually need the human machine learning expert to solve new problems. And really, if we want to get to systems that are generally intelligent, we can't have a human in the loop for every new problem that we want to solve. And so this, I think, is a pretty fundamental thing that we really need to make progress on to really get towards more intelligent systems that can do millions and millions of different tasks. Uh, but really, we want to see if we can use data and a lot more computation to get good solutions. So the way this works, uh, one of the ideas in the work that we're pursuing is an idea called neural architecture search. So one of the issues with uh, deep learning is a human machine learning expert normally sits down and just makes a bunch of decisions about what kind of uh, network architecture they're going to use. Is this going to have nine layers or 17? Uh, are they going to have you know three by three filters at each layer or four by four or seven by seven? How are they going to be connected? Um, and so the idea behind neural architecture search is we're going to have a uh, a model generating model, and we're going to train that model using machine learning, uh, using reinforcement learning, actually. And so the model generating model can generate a description of a network architecture, and then we're going to train, uh, and we can generate, say, 10 of those models, and we're going to train each of them for a few hours on the problem we actually care about. And then we can use the loss, the accuracy of each of these generated models, as a reinforcement learning signal to the model generating model so that we kind of steer the model generating model away from experiments that didn't work very well and towards network architectures where the results were very good. And if you run this loop many, many times, you know, perhaps training 20,000 models, you end up with models that are quite good. Um, and so here's an example on the left of a model that the architecture search process came up with um, for a image recognition task, CIFAR-10. Uh, which has the advantage that it's been very well studied by the machine learning community. So everything except the last four lines here are sort of human-generated uh, new improvements of state-of-the-art results on the CIFAR-10 uh, image recognition task. And you can see the error rate dropping over time. Uh, and this, at the time we published the neural architecture search work, the state-of-the-art was 3.74%. Uh, neural architecture search automatically got to a model that got 3.84%. Um, so that's pretty promising. We then scaled that work up to ImageNet uh, scale, which is a much, much bigger problem. It's a million images that are sort of full resolution instead of 60,000 images that are very small. And this graph shows you um, the accuracy of a bunch of different models for ImageNet. Uh, and the uh, the x-axis is the amount of computation that each model requires for to give you a prediction for a given image. And so generally, more computation gives you more accuracy. Uh, so you see this general trend. Um, and each one of these dots here represents years of effort by sort of the top machine learning researchers and computer vision uh, research groups in the world. Um, and the really nice thing is when we applied AutoML to this, uh, we actually can get a range of models with different computational costs. But each of those models is better than the corresponding human-generated models at that sort of level of computation. And so that's true both at the highest end, where you see um, you know, much less computation and slightly better accuracy than the best state-of-the-art models uh, at the time this one. And also true at the low end, where you might have a, a very lightweight model that you want to run on, say, a mobile phone. And you see a pretty significant jump in accuracy for basically the same computational cost. So that's pretty exciting. 
And so that's kind of an early sign that we can actually build these flexible systems that with enough computation can solve new problems automatically. And the only drawback is we're going to need a lot more computation. And so uh, that actually comes to another point, which is that neural networks and all the algorithms that I've been talking about have two really nice properties. Um, the first is that reduced precision for all the computations in a neural network uh, is generally just fine. It's fine to do you know, one significant digit of precision for the computations rather than lots of significant digits. Um, and the other property that they have is that there's a handful of specific operations in these models. Essentially, nearly all the computations are made up of, of dense linear algebra operations, things like matrix multiplies, vector dot products, uh, things like that. So if you can build computational devices that are specialized at doing reduced precision linear algebra, then you have a chance of really speeding up the kinds of computational computations you can do here. Um, and so we've been working in this space for a while. Uh, we've developed uh, a, set, a set of devices called tensor processing units. And this is the second generation one, which is a device that's designed for neural net training and inference. It, this device uh, is, provides about 180 teraflops of computation, which is quite a lot. Has 64 gigabytes of very high speed memory. And it's designed to be connect, connected together into larger configurations that we call pods. And so each of these pods is 64 of those devices, and it's 11 and a half petaflops of computation, um, of low precision computation. But just as a point of comparison, the number 10 supercomputer in the world is about 10 and a half petaflops of compute uh, of high, higher precision computation. But still, uh, this is sort of on that scale. And uh, this is sort of a dedicated machine learning supercomputer. Um, and we've actually made these available externally through our cloud product, so people can rent time on these cloud TPU devices. You essentially get a virtual machine with a cloud TPU attached. Um, we're also making them available to researchers who are uh, committed to doing open machine learning research. So we have about 1,000 of these devices that we're making available to researchers who have interesting projects. Uh, and you can sign up at this uh, URL here uh, by sending in a proposal. Um, and we're excited to see what people will do with this. Um, the only requirement is that they'd be willing to, to publish the work that they do. So with that, I'd like to just highlight that I think deep neural networks and machine learning are really producing significant breakthroughs that are solving and are going to solve some of the world's like grand challenges, um, which I think is tremendously exciting. Uh, if you're not thinking about how to use neural nets to solve your problems, you probably should be. And if you look at our team website, g.co slash brain, and also on tensorflow.org, you'll find a lot more information. In particular, the brain website has lots and lots of our papers and more information about each of the sub areas that we're working in. And with that, thank you very much. And I will now, I think, uh, figure out how to get out of this and go back to not presenting. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have seen some of these slides before, but every time I see them, I'm like, wow, I'm really inspired. Um, uh, I think at least some of us or most of us in the room aspire to do research with that kind of exponential curves. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we, uh, we, we want to do some Q&A. Um, anyone has any questions? OK. Uh, hi, Jeff. Uh, Manish Gupta. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, so you talked about applying uh, machine learning, deep learning to uh, on healthcare problems, right? Predictive uh, problems. Uh, so in our experience, what we saw was even when you have very high F scores, let's say of the order of uh, 0.95 and so on, F1, uh, uh, the because of the class imbalance, you still run into the problem that the number of false positives is still higher than the number of true positives for many, many predictive problems. So have you been able to kind of overcome kind of those kinds of uh, those challenges? And I mean, uh, get accuracy high enough uh, where you are actually true positive. I mean, your false positives mm -hmm. are much fewer than the true positives. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, obviously, if you have kind of rare conditions, 
one of the things you can do is enrich the training set that you have to make sure that you have more balanced coverage of the rarer conditions and the more common conditions, and then correct for the sort of adjustment you made to the background probability in enriching the training set when you're doing testing. And that, that can really help a lot. And so that's the general technique we use for that. Um, and also, uh, these things allow you to sort of control the false positive versus false negative rate um, with different thresholding uh, you know, choices. And one thing I forgot to mention about the diabetic retinopathy work, we've actually been doing, we, we've actually concluded clinical trials in India working with the Aravind uh, uh, Eye Hospital Network. And we're now actually doing uh, patient uh, treatment using uh, this model. So, um, actually, we are going to hear from Varun Gulshan in a session later today about exactly this work. Great. Yeah, he will give you many more details. More questions for Jeff? There's one there. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. This is Partha from IIC Bangalore. Uh, so, like, you know, uh, there is this uh, well-recognized problem of explainability in AI and machine learning. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a definite problem for some kinds of, of uh, domains. You know, I think there are some problems where you just want the most accurate thing possible and you don't necessarily care much about it, interpretability or explainability. But there are other domains where it's actually very important to have uh, the system be able to give you some insight and intuition about why it's making a certain prediction. You know, I think healthcare is one particularly good one uh, it, where, where you really do care about that. If you, it's much more actionable and usable for a say, doctor if you can say something more than patient needs heart valve replacement, right? It's better if you say patient needs heart valve replacement and it's because I see this like brief description in a medical note from two years ago, and this test result is a little elevated and um, this other condition, right? And so we're doing a fair amount of work in our, in our group on interpretability of, of medical images. I think you saw on the, uh, the retinal images where we can now use those as a new cardiovascular health metric. One of the things those models are able to do is to describe what pieces of the eye and the retinal image they're actually looking at when making those different kinds of predictions. And so uh, I'd encourage you to look at a website called distill.pub, uh, which one of my colleagues, Chris Ola and Shan Carter, are actually uh, publishing a series of articles there about how do we make models more interpretable. Uh, and they have some really nice investigations of visual models and interpretability for those. OK, one more. Hello. Yeah, hi, Jeff. I'm uh, uh, Inba from DocsApp. Um, so I'm a health tech startup, and then uh, we are now building systems, keeping you know data and science and learning uh, you know at the back end of our product. So one of the challenges we generally see is that the volume of data in medicine is a lot less, especially quality annotated data, uh, compared to, say, another field like, say, be it images, imaging, or uh, uh, you know, be it uh, you know automated driving and so on. Uh, so, how do you overcome these challenges, and how do you work with uh, you know people from a different community, say the medical practitioners, for example, and uh, uh, how is the adoption? Because finally, for a tech to be useful, uh, adoption on the other side as well is needed, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, I would say that healthcare is a you know challenging space to operate in for many reasons. First of all. The data volumes every individual healthcare organization generally has are, are modest, not enormous. Um, and so that sometimes means it's more difficult to get the accuracy you might want on a particular problem. There's lots in, in the United States, especially, there's lots of regulatory challenges for deploying machine learning models. Uh, you know, you need FDA approval um, uh, for, for many kinds of things. Uh, there's very real and valid privacy concerns people have about their healthcare data. Um, but in general, we make partnerships with healthcare organizations. And the ones we've been doing in the United States so far, we've sought out healthcare providers that actually have pretty significant sized data sets. Um, we ask them to de-identify the data set so we don't actually get 
any personally identifying information for these data sets. We just kind of get the medical record without knowing who it is, or, or a large collection of medical records. Um, that allows us to do the research that we need to do to show that these models can have very high accuracy for these tasks that we care about. Um, and that, I think, is the beginning of a dialogue of how do we actually, you know, you know, that generally gets the healthcare organizations excited when you can show that you can predict something they really care about uh, with high accuracy. And that then sort of loosens the relationship a bit and makes it much easier to actually figure out what are the next steps, how do we actually take something like this and actually really deploy it and, you know, maybe get more data, maybe, you know, label a bunch more data uh, in appropriate ways. And so lots of things like that, I think, can lead to, to sort of more rapid adoption and, and success in this space. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I think that's, uh, I know there are other questions, but we'll have to. So thanks, Jeff. Thanks very much. Thanks. Enjoy your day.